had the largest number of professed and devoted followers so far in literary history. The Holy Bible has to be dismissed from the competition, although referred to by devout men as the word of God, it is in publishing terms an anthology. That leaves only two contenders, Karl Marx and Mohammed. By any accounting, the followers of Marx now greatly outnumber the sons of the prophet. He was buried here in Highgate Cemetery, London, on March 17, 1883. It is a place of only minor pilgrimage until about 20 years ago, Marx's grave was almost unmarked. A near companion is Herbert Spencer, and it's hard to imagine two men who are taking less pleasure in the company of each other. Karl Marx, we should know, was not one but many men, a truly prodigious congregation. The world celebrates him as a revolutionary, the parent of revolution. He was also a very great social scientist. Many would say with justice, the most original and imaginative economist and the most arrogant political philosopher of his age. He was also a brilliant journalist. All American Republicans should note with pride that during an exceptionally meager time in his life, Marx was sustained by the New York Tribune, and he was Spotted's best correspondent. Marx was also an historian with a living sense of history. This was most important. Perhaps it is a sense of history that divides good economics from bad economics. Anyway, I've often thought so. Marx led, and perhaps it would be more accurate to say he made, the revolt against the world that we've been examining in the last two programs. He would have expected us to look at that revolt and the man who made it in their historical context. This is the pleasant house where Marx was born. It is a museum, a modest tourist attraction, a small source of profit for the now rather conservative Rhineland town of Trier. Trier, or Trev, is at the head of the Mosul Valley. In 1818, it was a lovely part of Europe, and it still is. There was much here for anyone with a feeling for history. Once, as Augusta Trevorum, it was called the Rome of the North. It was the principal bastion against the German tribes that frequently, until 1945, erupted southward on the Latins. The Porta Nigra, the Black Gate, is the most impressive Roman relic in northern Gaul. Trier is now part of Germany. In 1818, it was only recently so. When the Marx family moved to this house, French occupation had just given way to Prussian rule. The casino club here was founded during the French occupation as a literary center, and Heinrich Marx, Karl's father, was a member. The building now houses the French army offices in Trier. No one now much notices the French, but before Marx's birth, the French presence was very important, and so was the transfer back to Prussia. The change was a matter of prime importance for Marx's parents. The French had been comparatively liberal with the ancient Jewish community of the town. Prussia was not. The Marx family, whose ancestors are buried here, was Jewish. Many of the ancestors had been rabbis. As an officer of the high court and the leading lawyer of the town, Heinrich Marx could not be a Jew. So he and his family were baptized. It was probably a purely practical step. By the time Karl Marx was born, the family had ceased to regard religious forms as deeply important. There was another legacy of France to Trier, and that was a general openness to ideas. These included the utopian and idealistic socialism of Saint-Simon and Fourier, and a condemnation of the great and growing differences between rich and poor. At his school here, the young Marx was captured by this mood. It survives in early schoolboy essays, one on the choice of a career. The choice of a career should be where one can best work for humanity. 
Our ashes will then be watered with the gleaming tears of noble men. Marx's involvement with religion traces to these years. Both his Jewish antecedents and his conversion to Christianity were in later years to be exceedingly useful to Marx's enemies. Anti-communism could be combined with anti-Semitism. Also, there would be a lurking suspicion that Marx was anti-Semitic. After all, he had been baptized. Some of his writing was very hard on Jews, although he seems to have used the term as a synonym or a metaphor for a, an avaricious businessman. This was common literary practice at the time, as it had been for centuries. And with all else, Marx was an atheist in a century that took religion very seriously. Not a passive, but an active atheist. In one of his memorable passages, he described religion as the opium of the people. It taught them to acquiesce patiently in hardship and in exploitation when they should rise up in angry revolt. To be Jewish, possibly anti-Semitic, of parents baptized as Protestants in a Catholic land, and to be militantly hostile to religion, protected Marx and his followers forever from any threat of religious applause. Marx and religion would be forever antipathetic. To his idealism, the young Marx soon added a strong streak of romanticism. It's a tendency that has been richly nurtured over time by the Rhine and the Mosul. While still in his middle teens, he affirmed his love for Jenny von Westphalen. Jenny was the daughter of the town's leading citizen, Baron Ludwig von Westphalen. Westphalen was an intellectual and a liberal, and he'd taken a great liking to the young Marx. Walking on the banks of the Mosul, he introduced his young friend to romantic poetry and also to the notion that the ideal state would be socialist, not capitalist. It'd be based on common property, not private property. This was obviously a thought of some importance for the young Marx. At 17, Marx was sent down the Mosul and the Rhine to Bonn, to the university. This was then a small academy of a few hundred students, rather aristocratic in tone and also romantic in mood. That was still Marx's mood. He now extended it on from poetry to the related fields of dueling and drinking. Even by the rather relaxed standards of the time, he seems to have been a very idle student. He stayed at Bonn only a year. And then moved on to Berlin. This was much more than a change in universities. It was a change into the very center of German, even European, even Western intellectual life. Marx fell under the spell of the philosopher George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel and one group of his university followers, the young Hegelians. Hegel had been dead for five years, but his life force in the University of Berlin remained wholly undimmed. Marx was profoundly influenced, an influence that would last for his lifetime. Hegel is not easy for the Anglo-Saxon or American mind. My feeling for his ideas, I confess, has always been a little insecure. What Hegel called the dialectic was the enduring conflict by which man achieves liberation and perfection, a life ruled by reason. The conflict is between opposites, theses and antithesis, leading to a new synthesis. Thus, from the conflict between savagery and law comes freedom, the new synthesis. But freedom is the new synthesis nurtures new conflicts. History is this process of constant transformation. But it is an optimistic transformation, one that yields eventually the perfect state. Hegel felt the Prussian state of his time came close to that perfection. 
This was a thought that Marx strongly rejected. For him, the Hegelian transformation had far to go. Modern Marxists are better satisfied with one part of modern Germany, East Germany, East Berlin. How Marx would react to this as a final stage, as perfection, is much less certain. In his own time, and most of all in Germany, he saw the Hegelian process as highly incomplete. The capitalist synthesis was nurturing the forces that would bring the next conflict the further synthesis. That synthesis for Marx would, of course, be socialism. For Marxists, viewing the modern socialist states, watching the May Day parade here in East Berlin, it makes for a very interesting question. Has the Hegelian process stopped? Is it still continuing? Does socialist discipline produce an intellectual antithesis? Does it make scientists, poets, artists, writers, intellectuals into the new antagonistic class? It's a highly pregnant thought to which Marx, if he returned, might well be open. Most modern Marxists are content to have the Hegelian process come to an end with the present state of socialism and its discipline. Neither Hegel nor Marx should be carried to inconvenient extremes. In 1841, Marx left Berlin. He would henceforth himself be a part of the Hegelian process, one of the great instruments of its transformation. He went soon to Cologne, like Trier, also recently redeemed from France, and more liberal for the experience. In France, what wasn't prohibited was permitted, but in Prussia, what wasn't permitted was prohibited. In this environment, Marx became a journalist, and he was an immediate success. He was a good journalist, careful, intelligent, intense. His language was varied and resourceful, with much indication of the solid power to come. The Rheinische Zeitung was being financed by the rising industrialists of the Rhine and the Ruhr. For them, Marx was a force for progress, an apostle of the modern economic world, liberalism, freedom of enterprise, if that was the choice, as opposed to the dead hand of feudalism, with all its restrictions and restraints. They soon made him editor. He was also a force for moderation. The word communism, though still indistinct as to meaning, was now coming into use. Marx described some of the contributions to his newspaper. Scrawls, pregnant with world revolution and empty of thought, written in slovenly style and flavored with some atheism and communism, which these gentlemen have never studied. I declared that I considered the smuggling of uh, communist and socialist ideas into casual theater reviews was unsuitable, indeed, immoral. Marx, quite possibly, should be brought back to deal with some modern radical literature. Under Marx, the paper grew in circulation and in influence over Germany, and in interest to the censors who thoughtfully reviewed the proofs of each issue each night before it went to press. They were constantly disturbed, but especially by Marx, on dead wood. Wood was a metaphor of Marx's thought of the time. Anciently, the people of the Rhineland had gone to the forest for firewood. Now wood had become valuable, and the right was withdrawn. Public property had become private property. David McClellan, to whose fine biography of Marx I'm very much indebted, tells how the cases against wood and against the wood collectors clogged the courts at the time. Marx thought private property ought to be defended with some discretion. If every violation of property, without distinction or more precise determination, is theft, would not all private property be theft? Through my private property, 
Do not I deprive another person of this property? In these same months of 1842, Marx came to the support of old neighbors, the wine growers of the Mosel Valley. They were suffering severely from competition under the Sulfurine, the common market that the German states had recently adopted. Again, no one will think his solution extreme. To resolve the difficulty, the administration and the administered both need a third element, which is political without being official and bureaucratic. An element which, at the same time, represents the citizen without being directly involved in private interests. Now, this resolving element, composed of a political mind and a civic heart, is a free press. So there was Marx, the defender of freedom of the press. He also, in his columns, criticized the Russian Tsar and urged a more secular approach to divorce. Obviously, this sort of thing could not go on. In March 1843, the Prussian government cracked down, suppressed the paper. Physically, Marx's German years were now over. In spirit, he would return to Germany again and again. Wherever Marx might be, his thoughts would return to the land of his birth and of his education. And before leaving this time, he forged a new tie. He went to Kruznach and married Jenny. A little earlier, she had written to urge him, come what may, to keep clear of politics. That was indeed a slender hope. By autumn, Marx and Jenny were in Paris, at the very center of the political life and debate of the age. Here, all that was new began. Or so, anyhow, it seemed. The Great Revolution was only 50 years in the past, that of 1831, only 12 years before, and that of 1848, less than five years ahead. The streets of Paris were full of refugees from Prussian censorship and repression, and many were young revolutionaries, as now. Marx and his wife lived here on the left bank, in the Rue Veneau. The Marx family lived at several addresses along this street, for the longest time here at number 38. Once he was settled here in Paris, Marx got ahead with his next journalistic enterprise, the editing of the Deutsch Französische Jahrbücher, the German-French yearbooks, really a magazine. By calling it a book, he hoped to avoid censorship. The reference to France in the title uh, was a gesture. Though he was here in Paris, Marx's thoughts at this time were almost wholly on Germany. In France, every class of the people is politically idealistic and is not primarily conscious of itself as a particular class, but as a representative of general social needs. The proletariat is only beginning to exist in Germany through the invasion of the industrial movement. Thus, we are now starting to begin in Germany when France and England are beginning to end. When all interior conditions are fulfilled, the day of German resurrection will be heralded <laughs> by the crowing of the Gallic cock. I judge him to be saying only that change in Germany, peaceful or otherwise, would follow change in France. However, the Prussian police were very sensitive men. They decided that this was dangerous stuff. So the first double issue of the yearbook was confiscated at the border. There were now no German readers. There never had been any French readers or contributors. So the publication was obviously in trouble. Marx, by this time, was also quarreling with his fellow editor. So the German-French yearbook came to an end. The first issue was the last. In the next weeks, however, something more important happened. A traveler arrived in Paris and came to see Marx. It was Friedrich Engels. There had been a previous casual encounter, and now they met in a cafe, talked, met again, talked further and formed what was to be a lifelong bond. Engels would be Marx's editor, collaborator, admirer, and banker of last resort. 
But Marx's life was not spent talking in the cafes, but in these rooms. Marx now settled down for a period of serious reading and study, perhaps the most intense of his life. This was the time when many of the ideas which were to dominate his later years took form. Uh, one I think I should mention in particular. It has variously been called economic determinism or the materialist conception of history. For Keynes, ideas were the motivating force in historical change. Marx carried this a step further back. The accepted ideas of any period are those that serve the dominant economic interest. Political economy starts from labor as the very soul of production. And yet it attributes nothing to labor and everything to private property. Intellectual production changes its character in proportion as material production is changed. The ruling ideas of each age have ever been the ideas of the ruling class. I must say I've never thought that Marx uh, was wrong on that proposition. Social truth in our time has a fairly remarkable way of serving important economic interest. While studying here in Paris, Marx continued his writing, and he was still much preoccupied with Germany. His writing outlet was now Forwards, Forward, which was the organ of the German refugee community here in Paris. The censors were still on guard, and in another less than pithy comment, Marx said, It must be admitted that Germany has a vocation to social revolution that is all the more classic in that it is incapable of political revolution. For as the impotence of the German bourgeoisie is the political impotence of Germany, so the situation of the German proletariat is the social situation of Germany. The political soul of revolution consists in a tendency of the classes without political influence to end their isolation from the top positions in the state. To translate and diffuse that rhetoric, Germany resists peaceful social change, so it invites revolution. One yearns for an age when policemen were aroused by thoughts like that. But the Prussian police were aroused. They complained to the French authorities to harbor a writer. Uh, such a writer was not a neighborly act. It called for a friendly, fraternal gesture of repression. So Guizot, the French Minister of the Interior, issued an order for Marx's expulsion. That was on January 25, 1845. And on 24 hours' notice, the Marx family, there was now a baby girl, departed for Brussels. Brussels was a pleasant home, also a base for more travel, to England to continue his association with Engels and for meetings of the newly founded Communist League. For the Communist League in 1848, Marx with Engels composed the tract that after 125 years still rings in men's ears. That was the Communist Manifesto. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guild master and journeyman, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight. A fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large, or in the common ruin of the contending classes. The Communist Manifesto was incomparably the most successful political tract of all time. To this day, when politicians proclaim their program, the organ tones of the manifesto, if not the content, sound through the hall. It 
The bourgeoisie has created enormous cities, has greatly increased the urban population as compared with the rural, and has thus rescued a considerable part of the population from the idiocy of rural life. During its rule of scarce 100 years, it has created more massive and more colossal productive forces than have all preceding generations together. The manifesto is not without contradictions. There is, in fact, none between Marx's praise of capitalism and its accomplishments and his promise of its extinction. These are different stages in the historical process. Nor, as pedants have suggested, is there any real conflict between his call for action and the revolution that he held to be inevitable. Why not advance the inevitable? The communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. That the ruling classes tremble at a communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries, unite. But there is conflict between his immediate program and his hope for revolution. The program, by all modern standards, is a collation of reformist measures, the kind of action that helps make capitalism more tolerable, the revolution, in consequence, less imminent. The heavy progressive for graduated income tax, free education for all children in public schools, equal liability of all to labor, establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture, combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of the distinction... In one way or another, in the advanced capitalist countries, much of this got done. And these reforms did help to take the raw edge off capitalism, did without doubt have the effect of postponing that forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions for which Marx had hoped. Thus did Marx the reformer defeat Marx the revolutionist. The revolution, when it came, came in those countries, Imperial Russia, China, where the reforms Marx urged were never known. By 1848, as a subversive, Marx was at the head of all the police lists. The Belgians, though more liberal than their neighbors, were also nervous about harboring so dangerous a man. But on almost the same day that he was expelled from Brussels, he was invited back to France. That was because 1848 was the year of revolutions in Berlin, Vienna, Prague, and here in Paris. Many people still connect that year with Marx and the Manifesto. Neither had a, an appreciable influence. The revolutions came, but the words of the Manifesto were still all but unknown. All revolutions have a geographical center. The French Revolution had its center, its great center on the Place de la Bastille. And the revolution of 1848, for a Marxist, was centered here on the Luxembourg Gardens. It was a most unlikely setting for a revolution, a bit, I suppose, like having a revolution in Regent's Park or even on the Boston Common. Actually, it was a place where the revolutionaries were segregated and kept talking. The Commission of Labor, the Luxembourg Commission, looked into the grievances of workers, heard talk of socialism and end to private property, and the children remained at play outside. Everything here, it was hoped, would be harmless, while elsewhere in Paris, the forces of conservatism, law and order, consolidated their positions. The statue of Alexander Ledru Rolla on the Hotel de Ville still reminds one of the ambiguities of the revolt. Once seeing a crowd pass his window, he exclaimed, I must follow them, for I am their leader. A modern note there. In 1848, he called out the troops to subdue the revolutionaries. There was ambivalence even in the selection of the flag. The provisional government rejected the red flag, the established badge of revolt. The tricolor was thought better for the public credit. 
Such was the revolution of 1848 in Paris. The blood would not be in the revolution, but in stopping it. This might be a good time to reflect on the nature of revolution, what it takes to make a revolution successful. Revolution is a word that comes very easily to our lips. If conservatives knew how hard it is to have a revolution, they would be far less worried than they are about the danger. They're far, far safer than they know. Three conditions are absolutely essential. There must be determined leaders, men who know exactly what they want, men who know that they have everything to gain, and also that they have everything to to lose. They must have disciplined followers, uh, men who will accept orders, uh, won't think for themselves. It's my impression that this also is inconsistent with the revolutionary tendency. Uh, people do, who participate in revolutions, do want to think for themselves. Well, that can't be allowed. And Finally, the other side must be weak. All revolutions are the kicking in of a rotten door. They're by men who charge, men who charge ruthlessly into a, into a vacuum. All of these three conditions were present in the Russian Revolution of 1917. All three conditions were present in the Chinese Revolution after World War II. And all of these three conditions were absent here in France uh, in 1848. Underlying authority was strong and quickly reasserted. Eventually, the workers did leave the Luxembourg, marched to the Pantheon nearby. Then on to the classic gathering place of revolution across the river, the Place de la Bastille, whose tall column commemorates the revolution of 1830. Barricades were erected in the great Paris tradition, and supporters swarmed in from all the city. of late June 1848, the June days, the revolutionaries were driven back and their barricades overcome. 500 revolutionaries lost their lives in the fighting and 3,000 more were executed. Prisoners were taken and initially they were shot. But the neighbors around object <clears throat> objected to the noise, so they were put to the bayonet instead. The massacre extended here to the gardens. And according to legend, in another thoughtful gesture, the gardens were kept closed for several days until the blood was washed away and the mess was cleaned up. By then, Marx was again on his way. He had never had much hope for the success of the revolution, but he did write its epitaph. The Paris workers have been overwhelmed by superior forces. They have not succumbed to them. The momentary triumph of brutal violence has been purchased with the fracturing of the French nation into two nations, the nation of the possessors and the nation of the workers. The tricolor republic now bears only one color, the color of the defeated, the color of blood. Marx had been without hope because he thought the revolutionary sequence was wrong. He was unquestionably confirmed in his view that the bourgeois revolution, the capitalist revolution, had to come first. And then, and only then, could the true revolution of the workers succeed. Marx went on to Cologne to another brief job as an editor. 
In Cologne, he was still a voice for moderation. Let there be no reckless, adventurous action by workers that would lead only to disaster. He was not hurt. In Germany, too, revolutionary rhetoric was far in advance of the reality of power, and the revolt was crushed. Still, there was change. Before 1848, the old feudal classes and the new capitalists were in conflict. After 1848, they were united against the new threat of the workers, and they would stay united until the great ungluing of World War I. Nowhere would the Union be more secure than in Prussia, where Marx had his greatest hopes for revolutionary success. Moderate or not, Marx was now sent packing again. He gave thought to going to the United States, but he didn't have the money. Who will say how much he was missed? It had to be London, his last move. He crossed the channel on August 24, 1849. Behind him were several lifetimes, and he was all of 31. Before him lay three great tasks, forming the ideas that would guide the masses in revolution, creating the force that would bring the revolution, and making a living. All would be accomplished by words from his pen, a literal sea of words. Marx got financial help from Engels and from other friends. There was an occasional inheritance windfall from Trier, and there was the New York Tribune. 1857, when times were lean, the Tribune fired all of its foreign correspondents but two, and Marx was one of the two that was kept. But Marx was a terrible hand with money, where before his movements were at the behest of the police, now they were in advance of angry landlords and angry creditors. Thus, further migrations, ending up at last at number 28 Dean Street, Soho. Children came, six in all, and three of them died in the squalid, crowded rooms on the second floor. Marx continued to attract the thoughtful attention of the Prussian police. In 1852, a wonderfully literate police spy sent to Germany an account of the Marx menage. As father and husband, Marx, in spite of his wild and restless character, is the gentlest and mildest of men. Marx lives in one of the worst, therefore one of the cheapest quarters of London. He occupies two rooms. The one looking out on the street is the salon and the bedroom is at the back. In the whole apartment there is not one clean and solid piece of furniture. Everything is broken, tattered and torn. With a half inch of dust over everything and the greatest disorder everywhere. He is jealous of his authority as head of the party. Against rivals and adversaries, he's vindictive and inexorable. He will not rest until he has ruined them. The dominating trait of his character is a limitless ambition and love of power. In spite of communist equality, which he keeps up his sleeve, he is the absolute ruler of his party. In fact, he does everything on his own. And he gives orders on his own responsibility and will endure no contradiction. All this, however, concerns only his secret activity and the secret sections. At public meetings of the party, he is, on the contrary, the most liberal and the most popular of them all. It is known that great men come from log cabins. Likewise, great events begin in commonplace buildings. Over this Soho pub, the German Workers' Education Association met pioneers in the idea of world revolution. From here on to the Kremlin and the Great Hall of the People. In time, the Marx family got away from their squalid quarters. In 1856, a small inheritance from Germany allowed of escape, as Jenny Marx wrote, from the evil, fightful rooms which encompassed all our joy and all our pain. They moved to a suburban villa in Hampstead, then a brand new real estate development. There were more financial crises, but the worst was over. In later years, Marx had a wholly adequate income by the standards of the time. In the three decades 
that he lived in England, he had something more important even than income. Although income is not a negligible thing for those who do not have it. He had nearly complete security in thought and expression. This was something that the governments under which Marx had previously lived had some difficulty in appreciating. In 1850, the Austrian ambassador protested to the British government that Marx and his fellow members of the Communist League were engaging in all kinds of dangerous discussions, including even the wisdom or unwisdom of regicide. He received a wonderfully insouciant reply. Under our laws, mere discussion of regicide, so long as it does not concern the Queen of England, and so long as there is no definite plan, does not constitute sufficient grounds for the arrest of the, uh, the conspirators. As a conciliatory gesture, the British Home Secretary did say he was prepared to assist the revolutionaries financially in emigrating to the United States. Again, Marx didn't go. In London, he had another great resource, one that has been much celebrated. That was the library of the British Museum. It was in the British Museum that Marx wrote his enduring testament, Capital, Das Kapital. To summarize the central thesis of Capital must seem presumptuous. Yet if one gives only conclusions, not supporting argument, it is not impossible. Ricardo, as I hope some will recall, gave the world the labor theory of value, the proposition that the value of a product is based on the value of the labor needed to make it. Further, said Ricardo, there would be an ineluctable tendency for wages to fall to the lowest level necessary to sustain life. Landlords would do well, but workers would only just survive. Where Ricardo left off, Marx began. For Marx, the value that labor gave a product became a right, a thing to which labor was entitled. What labor did not get was what Marx called surplus value. This surplus value, profit more or less, was available to the capitalist for investment in plant and machinery as industrial capital. The capitalist was now the beneficiary, not the landlord. But Ricardo's iron law of wages still applied. Capitalists prospered, workers lived at subsistence level. Wages were kept down by unemployment. The unemployed were an industrial reserve army, always awaiting jobs, always keeping down wages. If the capitalist should re-employ all this labor, wages would rise. Profits would then fall, production would cease to be worthwhile, there would be a crisis, later called a depression. Then the unemployment that workable capitalism required, in Marx's view, would be restored. The profits of the capitalist would be used for investment, also by the large capitalists to gobble up the small ones the process of capitalist concentration. In consequence of this concentration, individual capitalists would grow bigger and stronger, but the system as a whole, since its political base rested on ever smaller numbers, would become weaker. This weakness, in combination with a falling rate of profit and the increasingly severe depressions, would make the system progressively more vulnerable to overthrow. Confronted by the disciplined proletariat it created, it would be overthrown. Along with the constantly diminishing number of magnets of capital, who usurp and monopolize all advantages of this process of transformation, grows the mass of misery, oppression, slavery, degradation, exploitation. But with this too grows the revolt of the working class, a class always increasing in numbers, and disciplined, united, organized by the very mechanism of the process of capitalist production itself. The monopoly of capital becomes a fetter upon the mode of production which has sprung up and flourished along with and under it. Centralization of the means of production and socialization of labor 
at last reach a point where they become incompatible with their capitalist integument. This integument is burst asunder. The knell of capitalist private property sounds. The expropriators are expropriated. You see the carbuncles on Marx's face. He once warned the capitalists that they would suffer for them. There was for capitalists one comfort. Their end would come not with a whimper, but with a wonderful bang. The first volume of Capital was not published until 1867, and the second two volumes were not published in Marx's lifetime. They were completed from notes by the ever-faithful Engels, and could have been completed by no one else. One reason for the delay was the early poverty and struggle. Another was scholarship. Marx was incapable of writing anything until he had read everything. Another reason was the endless swirl of discussion and debate and polemic in which Marx lived. In these years also, Marx was laying the foundations for the revolution, which he hoped, but never quite believed, was imminent. His instrument was an organization that would link together the workers of the industrial countries, those proletarians who, as Marx powerfully averred, knew no motherland. Now known as the First International, this revolutionary instrument was born in London on September 28, 1864, at a meeting attended by some 2,000 workers, trade unionists, and assorted intellectuals from all over Europe. A council was selected to which Marx became the secretary. The resolutions that were actually passed by the International calling for limitations on working hours, state support for education, nationalization of railways, were not very revolutionary. Reform was again the nemesis of revolution. And revolution had another nemesis, and that was nationalism. In 1870, Bismarck, who had once made overtures to Marx to put his pen at the service of his fatherland, went to war with Napoleon III. In a prelude to the vastly greater drama of August 1914, the proletarians of the two countries rallied to the defense, as they saw it, of their homelands. The Franco-Prussian War and the Siege of Paris were reported with much of the avidity with which modern disasters are enjoyed. The New York papers were very much interested. On March 1st, 1871, the German army made its triumphal march down the Champs-Élysées. Outrage at the incompetence of the old rulers, knowledge that the wealthy had departed Paris, offended pride, memory of the recent hunger and hardship, all combined again to bring revolt. It started here on the heights of Montmartre. The troops of the Republic sought to secure the guns that rightly they did not trust in the hands of the Parisian National Guard. In 1868, I went one night to the barricades put up that year on the left bank. History, I realized with some pleasure, is not over. For the Paris Commune, Marx had slightly more hope than in 1848. But once again, the aims were incoherent, the leadership ambivalent, and also Paris was not all France. Marx was eloquent on President Pierre, who crushed the Commune a master of small state roguery, a virtuoso in perjury, never scrupling to fan a revolution and to stifle it in blood. The savagery was formidable on both sides. On May 21, 1871, the troops of the Republic entered the city. Soon, much of Paris lay in ruins. It was a workmanlike job of destruction even by modern standards. 
some 20,000 revolutionaries were killed and 750 government troops. 38,000 were later arrested and 7,000 sent into exile. The last battle was fought among the monuments of Père Lachaise. sent a final saddened address to the Council of the Dying First International. Working men's Paris, with its commune, will be forever celebrated as the glorious harbinger of a new society. Its martyrs are enshrined in the great heart of the working class. Its exterminators, history has already nailed to that eternal pillory from which all the prayers of their priests will not avail to redeem them. Marx was indulging in wishful thought. Memory is not that long. But with the liquidation of the commune, the first revolution to use, however inaccurately, the root word communism came to an end. It was the only such revolution that Marx was to see. After the Paris Revolt, Marx continued his work. He also remained the high, although not the undisputed, judge of socialist thought. In 1875, the working class parties of Germany agreed on a program that deeply displeased him. Reform once again replaced revolution, but he also warned that for true communism, the old scar tissue of old capitalist thought must first disappear. Only then would come the great day when society would inscribe on its banners, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. Maybe these 12 words converted as many people to communism as all the other millions that Marx wrote in his lifetime. The last years were not for Marx a happy time. In December 1881, Jenny died. A few months later, the first and best beloved of his daughters also died. Distraught and very lonely, Marx too ceased to live. And on March 14th, 1883, with Engels at his side, he died. No one else would so march on from the grave. Fifty years after Marx published Capital, the first great revolution took place in his name in Russia. There have been more since. I have often thought that another Marxist legacy is almost as important. That is the emphasis he gave to the role of economic institutions in shaping political and social thought and action, and in doing so in all societies, what scholars have come to call economic determinism. How we make our living goes far to explain how we act, what we believe, the way we are governed, and the passions we display. And this lesson is a gift of Marx to Marxists and to non-Marxists alike.